This is a wonderful a surprise, uh, unexpected pleasure to be with you. And would you introduce yourself for everyone? Yes, I'm Hereditary Chief Phil Lane, Jr., a member of the Ahonkawa, Dakota, and Chickasaw nations of the United States and Canada. And uh, we're here at La Bourget, uh, outside Paris, here at COP21. And uh, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to say what you're here for, what you want to accomplish, um, what this all represents to you. I'm actually here at Chateau Millamont outside of Paris in a very, very quiet meeting of world leading scientists, indigenous leadership, and others coming up with solutions that we're going to announce on the 6th in a special press ceremony on a boat in the Seine River with indigenous people from around the world. Because we believe that under the best circumstances, even if the nation states were, would cooperate and were not being controlled by multinational corporations and truly were looking at the welfare of their grandchildren and the seventh generation, that they're not in this agreement coming up with what's going to stop climate change and restore our Mother Earth. And in the gap between what they're going to be committing to in terms of the whatever this agreement is, so in the gap between that and what it is going to take to have a sustainable future for our children, grandchildren, and their children and grandchildren, what do you see as the main driver to actually bridge that gap? Well, I believe the main driver, first of all, is for us to, to drop this misunderstanding that somehow these nation states have the power or have the will to actually do what is needed to stop climate change. It's we as a human family, the children of Mother Earth, who have to take the lead in this. Whether the nation states are ready to, whether they want to, we have to step forward and take the action needed for our grandchildren and children, not just for our grandchildren and children, but for those that are, in fact, abusing Mother Earth. We've got to think about their grandchildren, too. Yes, yes. So for those people who are seeing this, what's the action that they can take? Well, on the 6th, through our Four Worlds International Institute, www.fwii.net, and many other avenues, we'll be announcing this set of 12 direct actions that we believe that need to be taken immediately mm. to turn this thing around. And can you give us a sense of what those are? Well, one of them is very mm. practical. We know that we have unlimited energy through the sun. But in fact, the petroleum industry, those that want to make money, have tariffed and taxed solar energy to the degree that, for instance, the United States and Canada, some solar energy technology from China, for instance, is tariffed 270 percent. One of the actions we ask nation states to immediately do is this. First of all, eliminate all taxes and tariffs on solar energy, proven solar energy, so it can flow to the people. We don't care where the, what the lampshade looks like. We want the light. Mm. Mm. So what difference does it make? Let's stop competition over what we know is going to help Mother Earth. Mm. Secondly, we believe all subsidies to support further petroleum development should be removed by every nation state. Mm. Why should we be subsidizing with hard-earned public monies an industry that we know is destroying the planet? They have made enough money, enough money that they have more houses to live in than any human being can live in. Yes. So let's take then and those subsidies and move those over to subsidize the research and development and application of solar technology and other kind of technologies we know that can rapidly replace already an overabundance in use of petroleum energy as well as going beyond nuclear as well. We can see the dangers of nuclear energy as well. So that's that in terms of one. Okay. A second one is that, and this is obvious, we are living in a constant state of war. Yes. War that is driven by economic purpose. War that is now driving people to leave their homes, causing all kinds of confusion everywhere in the world, killing countless people destroying their cultures, destroying their lives. The biggest consumer right now of petroleum and the biggest polluter on this planet is war. Mm. War. And war creates terror. And terror creates more war. We've got to step outside that cycle 
And that's going to be, mean understanding we are one human family. Yeah. One human family. And the hurt of one is the hurt of all. Yes. The hurt of one is the hurt of all. Now, once we realize we're one human family, then it's clear to see that every form of prejudice must be wiped out. Every mm. form of prejudice. Mm. Whether it be prejudice of race, ethnicity, religion, sexual preference, gender, whatever that prejudice is, yeah. anything that makes us feel better than some other human being, mm. because we are truly, from prior unity, yes. one human family. Yes. It doesn't get spoken of this way often, but we can almost to use climate change as the opportunity for that kind of transformation. Absolutely. All these tests and difficulties come for our own perfecting. And so finally, mm. you know, we have in a way can acting you say, out. Can you say that again, just so that I can make sure that everybody got that? Everything that comes in our path, every test and difficulty comes for our own perfecting, our own growth and development, if we can see it that way. Mm. You know, I, what I see is this from what's happening. We have those old Godzilla movies, Rodan movies, yes. where this invader comes from outer space. We've seen the theme go on and on through so many movies and films. Yes. And the invader comes from outer space, next to you know, all the nation states of the world are coming together, and they come together and they drive off the invader from outer space. Well, we've been invaded from inner space. Mm. Been invaded from here. Mm. And that is our greed. This belief that the material world is the ultimate goal of the human being, mm. is to acquire as much material things as possible, and not realizing there's no happiness in the end from that. We're all gonna go back to the same Mother Earth. We're only here for a short time. And what motivates us in the worlds beyond is the qualities of compassion, kindness, forgiveness, justice. Not how much money I have. I haven't seen anybody drive up and put a dump truck full of money in somebody's grave lately. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the whole, the whole notion, whenever it came into existence, wasn't, but it wasn't, our, it wasn't always the case that you could own land. Exactly. You know, it wasn't always the case that you considered something that was yours, that could be bought, that could be sold, whether it was another human being, whether it was a piece of property. But at some point, it, it went from this oneness that you're speaking of to that this, was, this is mine, that's yours. If I'm going to have more for me, then it's going to be less for you, but that's okay because as long as there's a chance for you to get more too, then somehow the system is equitable, but it, but it completely, at the core, is not. Exactly, exactly, because the fact is that we are spiritual beings as well as physical beings. And every economic theory on the face of this planet, whether it be Marxism or capitalism, is simply based in a materialistic paradigm. We're a lot more than just physical beings. We're a lot more about us. And the fact is, is that if you think this outer physical world is going to give you the power and strength you need to endure whatever, try to go without sleep for about seven days and see what happens to a human being. We have to go back within ourselves. We have to go to sleep because in here is truly the power that continues us moving each day. And so I really see very simply, this is a lesson that the entire human family has needed to learn in our own spiritual growth and development. We've had to learn the hard lesson, which we're really coming to it now, that simply the acquisition of material things is not gonna bring us happiness. Simple. But we had to learn the lesson because we got all dazzled by all of a sudden here 300 years ago, you know, we see you know, about 1844, this parabolic curve, and all of a sudden we started going off the charts with technology. And people believed that science by itself was gonna solve every human problem. But I'll tell you this, science without values, science without, and I'm not talking about fanaticism, without spiritual values becomes a Frankenstein. Mm. At the same time, spirituality or religion without reason becomes fanaticism. Mm. So science and spirituality or religion have, are, have to go hand in hand because one comes from the same source as the other. And until we respect and utilize the tools of science with values, we're going to end up where we're at now. Yes, yes. And I think, there's a, I think there's a real connection because it's, it's actually, it actually happens that through history, many of the greatest scientists or physicists have eventually turned to things such as poetry or philosophy. Exactly, exactly. In fact, it's so incredible that towards the end of his life, Albert Einstein said, when we uncover 
the power of prayer, science will advance further than it's ever advanced before. You know, and uh, so it's true. I mean, quantum physics is something our indigenous people knew about forever. You know, when I came home from university, I always told my father different things I learned. And I started talking about the, the uh, uh, psychology of Carl Jung and all these different, and, you know, and then I started talking about quantum physics, and he took me further than what the scientists were talking about. And I said, Dad, why didn't you tell me that before? You know what he said to me? Son, you didn't ask me. <laughs> because if you don't know the question, yeah. how can you get the answer? Yeah. If we're stuck in this limited framework yes. of thinking, yes. and we believe it's just this way, but for me, like we talked out there when we met each other, yes. you know, we used to have to raise our hand to go to the bathroom yes. in class. Yes. I'm not going to raise my hand anymore to ask to go to the bathroom. Yes. We need to take direct action in a good way. Yes. And, you know, recognize the limitations and the impotence, the impotence right now because these structures of the nation states are not able to manage the state of enfolding human consciousness, as yes. simple as that. They're not able to do it. Yes. And I think also in terms of the indigenous people that, that, that it, it, in the conversations I've been able to, to have is that there's such that sense of one, that they've done, they're, they are least, they're least at cause in the matter of this crisis and they're bearing the, the, the bulk of the brunt with the, with the, the fewest amount of resources to actually even mitigate or adapt in, in the situation. Yeah. Well, at the same time, you know, one time I went to speak when I was young. You know, I used to be invited to speak to a lot of uh, high school graduations of indigenous young people because they saw me as a young, you know, yeah. now that I'm getting older, I'm an elder, they invite me again, but in the middle ages they didn't. And after I spoke so passionately, it'd be how we loved the environment, how we did this, how we did that, we always prayed. One of the young people came up afterward and said, Phil, he said, if we were so great, if we had such a spiritual foundation, why did God punish us? Mm. Now, that was a good question. Mm. And I prayed about it and thought about it. And I realized, you know, do you think you say you believe and will not be tested? So for 500 years, we have held on, mm. sometimes through a tremendous pain, mm. but we've never given up. We've continued to pray. And we go into our Sundance. Where you, for four days, you have a little bit, you go without food and water. You know, sometimes you pierce or into a sweat lodge, or into a longhouse, and we go through these ceremonies. But when you come out, you're stronger. Where we're coming out of a 500-year Sundance, and we are stronger than we've ever been. And the greatest thing we have to give is the fact that we're coming and embracing everybody as a human family and in forgiveness. You can do what you can, but one brother of mine, Phil Lucas, great filmmaker, passed on the spiritual world. He used to tell me, he said, and I didn't like what he had to say, he said, Phil, the only person that can teach the person with the whip what forgiveness is about is a person being whipped. Now, that's heavy. That's heavy. But, you know. It's, it's just, first of all, just so wonderful to have this opportunity to be with you. And I'm really, uh, I'm taking away, you know, that people speak often about climate action yeah. and what to do and it's but it's always from me to out to to the UN you know to to the government to the corporations but there's there is that action but there's also the action within exactly you where i discover my own abundance my yeah. my own prosperity my own sustainability yes. so and that there is a direct connection between the discovery for myself of that and then what that is for the whole Exactly. Thank, thank you so much. Wow. Been a great visit. Just one. Just, great thank visit. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Just thank you. Thank you. Mm. You know, I wanted to say this. I always say this. If anybody understands what I'm saying, it's because you already knew it or you couldn't understand it. Mm. If anybody sees any qualities in me that they like, it's because you already had them or you wouldn't see them in me. Mm. So we're just mirrors to each other. Yes. Yes. Wonderful mirrors. Wonderful mirrors. Wonderful mirrors. It is a joy being a mirror with you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay.